Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our natural living workshop with Lily Cunning, herbologist. Lily is going to be presenting herbs for vitality and aging today. And she has a slew of information to share and lots of handouts. So you'll be getting those handouts in the mail as well, in the email as well. So Lily, um, we are uh, very glad uh, for you to join us today and to share this topic. Well, thank you. Um... So yeah, um, I'm Lily, I do clinical herbalism, uh, consultations, and then I'm also a formulator for Haven Herbs, which uh, helps me to volunteer my time here as well. And you'll be able to get in touch with us. I have a contact in the, the last page of this slideshow in case you want to get a hold of me or Haven for any reason. But um, we're going to go over a whole bunch of topics. Um, I was telling Darlene before everybody arrived, this is a huge topic. I've never presented this one as part of the Natural Living series before. Um, and it, it, people dedicate their entire careers to gerontology and vitality and aging. And so we're going to go over quite a lot of stuff, but I'm going to go over some things more than others. Uh, and it also depends on individual interest. Um, you know, we can easily skip over things that people don't have questions to, or just sort of cover it and then move on. Um, but you know, don't be shy, feel free to put your question in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, at any point during the, uh, presentation, you don't have to wait till the end. I know I usually can't remember my question if I have to wait till the end. So, um, <clears throat> We're going to be covering a whole bunch of different systems of the body and, and different types of wellness and how herbs uh, and food in particular uh, can uh, add to your wellness as you age because the alternative to aging is, is not preferable. So we want to keep you well and healthy as you age. Um, but we kind of want to talk about what aging is first. Um, you know, uh, it's obviously the, the ability that you're getting older, but um, there's a lot of theories as to why health and different systems decline over time as you get older. And believe it or not, there's no uh, one universal accepted theory about it. Um, you know, there are ideas about free radicals in the body. And so taking antioxidants is recommended. There's the idea that like connective tissue in your body, um, you know, loses its elasticity, its collagen and elastin, uh, and then it alters the stability of your body structure. Um, there's a genetic theory that like cells are sort of programmed to have a certain lifespan um, at the chromosomal level. Um, and there is like an immuno, uh, immuno, immunological, there we go, immunological uh, theory where, you know, changes in the immune system uh, cause the system to, to wear out. Um, I kind of think of it like um, everything slows down as you get older, your metabolism slows down and so does your cell regeneration. Um, and as we get older, the space in between getting new cells to sort of take over and, and do the job of a system or an organ get longer and longer in between cycles and, and uh, less frequent, right? When we're young, our body is just ripping through cells and making new ones and it's not a big deal. And, you know, so after you hit age 30, things start to slow down. Um, and, you know, if you're not regenerating new cells, whether that's lung cells or skin cells or heart cells, um, things are going to have more wear and tear on them. So this adds to uh, all kinds of issues with different systems that are outlined here. We can move on to the, the next slide, I think. Yeah, um, <clears throat> you know, like I said, there's lots of different theories about aging. There's no one that uh, is universally agreed to, but what is noticed and is observable is that aging impacts all your body systems, but it impacts different people differently. Some people, um, you know, start having cardiovascular issues and other people have sort of cognitive impairment or um, their eyes 
don't see as well. You know, there's, there's different systems that are affected. Um, and so I want you, as we're going through these things, to think about like, what are the issues that run in your family or that you're experiencing personally so that we can help you get out of this presentation uh, some personalized information. Although if you have a lot of personalized questions, I would recommend contacting me beyond the scope of this one hour so that I can uh, assist you more directly. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a lot of phlegm today and I haven't taken my allergy tincture. Um, there's a long list of, of daunting things that could happen to you in aging, but the, the overall theme of this series is staying well. It's natural living and it's very holistic in its outlook. And so we're gonna talk about some things that often happen as we age, but also we're gonna talk about ways to keep those systems humming along and doing well, because honestly, um, you know, prevention over cure, right? Um, let's go on to, I think the first one's gut health. Is that right? Yay, it's gut health. Um, so the digestive tract in an organism, whether it's a human or a bunny or um, even, you know, some kind of microscopic uh, organism, the digestive tract is the first thing that forms. And there's a reason for that, you know, um, it is the most primary system and everything that gets created afterwards, the nervous system, the endocrine system, the immune system, all have connections and uh, interactions with the gut. And so uh, gut health is super important to everyone for wellness. Um, you know, if you're having anxiety, depression, uh, immune system dysfunction, hormonal imbalances, whether that's the thyroid, the pancreas, or your sex hormones, one of the things that a holistic practitioner like myself is going to look at is your gut health um, and making sure that number one, your microbiome is up to snuff. Um, and that's your, you know, everyone knows about probiotics these days. Um, and, you know, we have commercially available probiotics that you can take to restore balance in your gut. Um, but also they come from fermented foods. Um, and I'm a huge fan of getting your nutrition and your medicine from your food. Um, so being able to, to digest uh, more microbiome, particularly after you've had an episode of diarrhea or anesthesia or chemotherapy or any kind of um, uh, pharmaceuticals, because um, that can often ravage the microbiome in your gut. Um, being able to take those supplementary uh, probiotics to kind of rebalance your gut. Um, the other thing that happens in the gut is you've got enzymes of different sorts being produced by the stomach and the pancreas and insulin also by the pancreas and bile by the liver and released by the gallbladder. And all of these uh, chemicals help us to digest our food and absorb nutrients properly. And they all need to be functioning well. And so <clears throat> there are supplements and then also looking at diet and nutrition that will help your digestive system balance itself and make sure that it's excreting all of these chemicals as you need them. Um, and one of the things that I'm gonna mention here and I, I can bring it up again a little later is the concept of taking digestive bitters. Um, so this is something that I can recommend to pretty much anyone uh, regardless of their particular health constitution because it's a food replacement. Um, in America, we don't eat enough bitter food. Um, we don't drink enough bitter drinks. And I bet you some of you are like, what do you mean bitter food? What's bitter? Um, and that's how I know you're not getting enough bitter. Um, in other cultures, uh, there are bitter greens, bitter melon, bitter roots um, that are used in either food or beverage that people take regularly. And bitter <clears throat> is something that Americans studiously avoid. But unfortunately, we're evolved to eat bitter. And when we don't on the regular, we have all kinds of weird gut imbalances. Um, Americans have more digestive issues and they go and seek doctor help or over-the-counter prescription uh, for digestive stuff more than any other country. Um, and I believe part of that is that we do not 
consume enough bitter. So digestive bitters is an herbal supplement that stimulates those bitter receptors that we don't just have on our tongue, but we also have throughout the entire digestive tract. All those organs that I mentioned, your liver and your pancreas, they all have bitter receptors. And when they're stimulated, they stimulate proper functioning. When they're not stimulated because we're eating way too much sugar, way too much processed food and not enough bitter, um, we start to see dysfunction in the gut. Um, and so that is one thing that uh, I highly recommend is, is to balance things out, making sure your microbiome is there either through regularly eating fermented foods or occasionally taking pre and probiotics, particularly after an episode where your gut flora is decimated and making sure you take bitter so that your body will produce those enzymes, bile and insulin to keep everything balanced. Do we have any questions about the gut right now? Nothing in the chat. Okay. Well, goodness gracious. All right. So emotional and mental health um, can be highly impacted by getting older. Um, so I put them together. They're not always together. Um, a lot of times emotional health is um, having to do with uh, anxiety or depression. Um, and this can be caused by situational stuff, but it can also be caused by uh, chemical stuff. Um, and they aren't opposites. They kind of feed each other. So you could have a situation that causes you to become depressed, which also alters your biochemistry and keeps you depressed and keeps you in this sort of cycle of, um, you know, sadness in this case with depression. Um, and then mental health can also include, you know, declining memory, um, which is common in aging, as well as pretty severe things like dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, and cognitive functioning is something that you want to keep nice and sharp. Um, although it's not really a muscle, we like to call the brain a muscle. And the more you use it, the more you engage with the world, the more you solve problems um, and get out there and do things, the more likely you are not going to have problems with your um, cognitive abilities. Um, now that can that can differ depending on your you know genetics and your family history, but you definitely want to exercise uh, physically and mentally every day so that you are keeping sharp. Um, there are quite a lot of things that uh, can impact emotional and mental health, and having a sense of purpose particularly as you age and maybe you no longer have children in the home to take care of, um, or maybe uh, a spouse is gone, um, really figuring out what your purpose is in this stage of your life can uh, lead to either anxiety or depression. And so I, um, I encourage you to seek out lots of different things that you're interested in because you may stumble upon a purpose that you never anticipated um, and being engaged with the world. Um, I also, you know, if you are feeling lonely multiple days of the week, then uh, seeking out social networks and uh, interesting things to do where you can meet other people, uh, is going to be great. I know that Darlene was talking earlier about how they want to open up uh, in a limited safe capacity different classes again starting in September at Cancer Support Community and that's fantastic. Um, you know if it can be done safely people need each other right. When we are in isolation it is lonely. You know um, I have an 11 year old kid and on some days, his father and I are both gone and he's here doing chores or doing schoolwork, but he gets lonely, right? And he's an only child. So he doesn't have any siblings to fight with and he's not going to a public school. So he's not getting that interaction. Um, we are social creatures and we need each other. So being able to seek out um, even just conversations if we're, you know, can't be in proximity to each other or you don't have someone that you cohabitate with that is safe for you to, you know, be maskless and not distanced with, then being able to just be in meat space 
uh, or you know, on Zoom talking to friends and family is super important. And having a support network, um, which is kind of the next level. There's there's social engagements of of talking with people and you know getting you know a connection going, but having someone to call when you're it's three o'clock in the morning and you're having some kind of crisis knowing who those people are and cultivating those kinds of relationships is really important um and if you don't have that 3 a.m person like making it a goal and figuring out maybe with the help of a counselor um how you get there is really important have someone that you can talk to um it's really important. And <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of staying sharp so that you're avoiding memory issues, dementia, Alzheimer's as much as possible, uh, there are lots of really great things that you can do. I love puzzles personally. Um, and so uh, Sudoku is a nice one or crosswords, or um, there's a there's a game show, like a trivia game show on the radio that I like to listen to and see if I can beat the, the guest at the answer or watching Jeopardy. Um, you know, all of those things really help keep you sharp and reading. Um, and that could be fiction or nonfiction. You don't have to stay sharp by only reading nonfiction. Fiction uh, is an amazing use of brain power and taking, you know, yourself to, um, you know, distant lands and different kinds of interactions is also using your brain and keeping it sharp. I see that we might have some questions in the chat, Darlene. Yes, um, I'm going to ask the second question first and then go back to the first question, if that makes sense. So the second question is, how can you overcome chemo brain? Mm. That's a tough one. And it takes time. First of all, I know it's hard to be patient because chemo is a long enough process as it is, right? Um, and then even afterwards, you're still sort of in that brain fog. There are all kinds of really wonderful foods and supplements that you can take to uh, sharpen up uh, brain functioning and also your endocrine functioning because a lot of that brain fog has to do with your microbiome being decimated uh, in your gut and it impacting both the immune and the endocrine system. Your endocrine system uh, basically regulates all of the hormones in your body, not just your sex hormones, but also your thermostat through your thyroid and uh, your digestion through your pancreas and your adrenals, which really have a lot to do with um, your, your feeling on top of things and sharpness and the amount of energy that you have to accomplish things throughout your day. Um, I'm gonna talk when we get to the supplement section about a class of herbs called adaptogens. And I even have some recipes for uh, everybody that are gonna be sent in the email that not only nourish the body, but also nourish the mind. And um, a lot of the herbs in those recipes are gonna be super helpful to help with chemo brain. Yeah. Awesome. Then the, the uh, first question was actually relating back to gut health. And the question is, what are some bitter or bitter foods? So a lot of them are roots. Um, in addition to um, dandelion, burdock, yellow dock, uh, burdock is called gobo in uh, Japanese cuisine. Um, there's also bitter melon. Uh, that's its name, bitter melon. And uh, there's all kinds of greens that have bitter constituents. They're not as bitter as the roots. The roots are like hyper concentrated, but um, kale has bitter constituents, collards, uh, mustard greens. Um, and then uh, a lot of times people make cocktails that or mocktails that have uh, a bitter extract in them. Um, made from genshen, which is a violet, and it's super bitter, and you only need like a little bit of it to kind of bitter your drink. In the summer, I like to get um, seltzer water and drop flavored bitters in it and drink that rather than drinking like a sweet drink. 
I find that uh, like sweetened drinks like lemonade or sweet tea just make me more thirsty. So um, having the bitter drink is actually quite refreshing. Takes a little bit of adjustment. If you're not used to consuming bitter things, yeah. you're be like, Ugh. but honestly, I'm thinking about soon. Oops. Oops. Hang on, I'll, uh, go, I'll go ahead and mute. I haven't done that yet. Oh. So. Um, once you start consuming bitter, your act, your body is going to realize what it's been missing, and you're going to start craving it. Um, I know it sounds weird, especially after that first dose of bitters. You're going to be like, I'm never going to crave this, but I promise you, you will. Um, yeah. Let's move on to the next slide. So cardiovascular health, this is a big one, right? Um, obviously having your heart function properly and your vessels getting nutrition and um, nutrients around your body to, to feed the cells, to do the work of the body is super important. And, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, cardiovascular health definitely declines. Um, People who are 65 and older are much more likely to suffer a heart attack or have heart disease or have a stroke. Um, and these are all issues with the cardiovascular system. Um, aging causes uh, changes in the heart and in the blood vessels, and it can lead to uh, arterial plaque, you know, cholesterol buildup. It can lead to um, arteriosclerosis, which is a hardening of the arteries, and that causes high blood pressure. Um, there's a lot of things. And then arrhythmia, uh, irregular heartbeat, like not predictable, not steady, like we need it, um, is also very common in people who are getting older. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's because the changes in the electrical system that govern the heart. So this is a cardiovascular issue, but it's a cardiovascular slash nervous system issues. Your autonomic nervous system, the nervous system component that does all the automatic work that you don't have to think about, like keeping your heart going, keeping your breathing, digestion, all of those things that you know you don't have to think about, thank goodness, because I probably forget, um, is uh, declining as well. You know, all of the the little fatty deposits around your neurons are deteriorating over time um, if you're not fortifying them. And this can lead to arrhythmias. Um, the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system is, is changing and the impulses aren't completely steady anymore. Um, and so, you know, it, it can be really scary actually. When you first experience arrhythmia, um, it, it might not be serious, but it feels serious sometimes. You're like, oh gosh, am I having a heart attack? Um, or am I having a panic attack? Um, and it means that, um, you know, you need to be more sensitive to salt and sugar. Um, and there are herbs actually that help maintain steady, nice heartbeat and tonify the whole cardiovascular system, which if folks have cardiovascular issues and they want to know um, some herbs that they can seek out. I'm happy to, to talk about that. Um, but this arrhythmia can also lead to edema in the ankles. If you have swelling in the ankles or feet, you should get it checked out. If it's like a chronic issue, maybe not 24 seven, but it happens multiple times a week to you and you're not sure why, you should talk to your doctor about it because it could be that you have an arrhythmia. Um, there are also other sources of edema or swelling. Um, edema is a symptom. It's not a, a, an issue in and of itself. And so you kind of have to get to the root cause, but you're definitely going to want to get your ticker checked out because that's a big one, right? Um, you know, other factors like thyroid issues or chemotherapy can weaken the heart muscle over time. And so if you have had to undergo chemo and radiation to treat your cancer, you know, you are at increased risk for arrhythmias and weakened uh, heart. And so taking cardiotonics, um, as we call them in herbalism, is all to the good. They're, they're basically consuming plants so that you can um, strengthen those systems and those organs. Um, and uh, we just don't regularly eat them for some reason anymore. So you take them as supplements instead. Um, any questions about cardiovascular stuff? 
No? Well, that's great. I'm glad nobody has cardiovascular stuff. Um, the next section is skin, you know? Um, a lot of people, it's funny, if you do a Google search and you talk about like issues in aging, a lot of it's gonna be cosmetic issues of the skin. Um, it's funny, the Google results, you know, it kind of gives you an idea of like what people are really thinking about. Um, so skin health is important and there's a lot of things um, that can be done to promote healthy aging in your skin. Naturally, what happens as you get older is your skin thins out because you're losing that layer of fat underneath. You're also losing collagen and elastin in the skin. And so it, it has a different texture than it used to. Um, and also all kinds of weird little spots start happening. I have darker, you probably can't see me, but I have like little patches of darker stuff on my forearms that didn't used to be there. Um, some people get them on the backs of their hands or on their face. Um, and then I put a picture of um, what's called, uh, what's it called? Oh, darn it. A cherry angioma. That's what it's called. Cherry angioma. And they can be flat or they can be raised but people get concerned about them when they find them for the first time. But this is something that often happens to people as they age. It's basically more common in people 30 or older. And, um, you know, this thing wasn't there. And then all of a sudden it is. And you're like, what is this thing? And I have some of them. Um, it's a small red dot and it's like a red mole or a growth. And um, the reason they're red is because small little uh, capillaries, blood vessels have collected within the growth. They are almost always benign, but of course, if you have a history of skin cancers in your family or you're a survivor of skin cancer, you're gonna wanna get every little thing checked out and you probably already have a dermatologist that does a regular inspection for you. Um, but uh, you know, if, if this is new to you and all of a sudden you see a red spot, get it checked out, but chances are it's one of these cherry angiomas. Um, you also can see a lot more skin tags as you get older. You might have always had some, but all of a sudden you get older and there's just a bunch of them. Um, and they're just finding out now that skin tags tend to be uh, an issue with the microbiome on the skin. So we, not, we don't just have those beneficial bacterias and yeasts in our gut. They're also living all over our skin and they help us. Um, we are truly a colony and not an individual. Um, and these, these bacterias are often killed by the products that we use in and on our bodies. And so taking a look at the kind of products that you're using on your skin uh, or your shampoo or any of these things will really make a difference in uh, how many of these things you see. Um, you know, certain individuals are more prone to skin tags than others. Um, but like my grandma had them, my mom had them, I have them. Um, but you can actually reduce the amount of them by making sure that you are not killing off your microbiome on your skin. Um, and there are things that you can apply or internally take that help with individual skin issues. Um, you know, wrinkle busting is a huge business. Like it's a multi-million dollar business um, because we've been taught that wrinkles are somehow not attractive. Um, but you know, there, there are ways to reduce their appearance, but wrinkles are just, you know, there on your face because you've smiled a lot. So that's not so bad. Um, any questions about skincare as you get older? Okay, well, I wanna say, wear your sunscreen, make sure your sunscreen is uh, like no higher than 30 SPF, because if you're using one of the higher ones, then you're using chemicals that aren't very good for you. And I can easily send you information on that. If you're smoking, please stop smoking. Not only is it bad for you, causes cancer and is bad for your lungs, but it also is bad for your skin. Um, stay hydrated. That really does help with skin health and make sure you're intaking enough healthy lipids, oils, fats. Um, 
For the longest time, American culture was obsessed with low fat food and not intaking a lot of food. But we found that fat is not really the problem. The, the problem is sugar, um, which you know also includes uh, carbohydrates that get turned to sugar in our body. Um, <clears throat> not fat. We need fat. Your brain needs fat, your nervous system needs fat, and your skin needs fat. So definitely, you know, eat some of those good fats, olive oil and, and uh, omegas, you know, fish oil and things like that. And there are foods that you can take that will help with the skin. Um, eating whole food and preparing it yourself and staying away from frozen food, canned food, boxed food and fast food is gonna be huge. <clears throat> I knew a woman in my twenties and she was the same age as me. Um, who just ate fast food every day for lunch and dinner. Like she just, she didn't cook. She didn't go grocery shopping and she just ate fast food and ate out all the time. And her skin looked terrible. Like it, it looks not right. It's hard to describe, but you know it when you see it, it just doesn't look right. Um, so eating whole foods, avoiding all those middle aisles, the frozen aisle, the packaged aisle, the canned aisles in the middle of the grocery store and sticking to the outside of the grocery store where all of the whole food is that you need to prepare yourself. Um, that's the best way to do it, to keep your skin nice and healthy. And if you feel like you need extra collagen, uh, you can obviously take a supplement, but the best thing is to get... Um, food that is high in collagen and boil it down and make like a collagen broth that you can take regularly. Chicken feet, fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so if you got a whole package of chicken feet from the butcher yeah. <laughs> for the market, you can put it in a pressure cooker or boil it down all day and you're going to get thick viscous broth that you can take as a supplement. You can put it in your smoothies. You can drink it as is. Um, it's going to be really fantastic for your skin um, and the rest of your body, all your connective tissue okay. so uh, and your nails and your hair. Because so we, have a, we have a question in the chat. Do you have a general list of products to use slash not use on your body? Um, so I luckily have not had to compile that list because there's a nonprofit called Environmental Working Group that has done it for me. They have a database called Skin Deep. Um, if you go to ewg.org, if somebody can put that in the chat, that would be great. Ewg, the letters, .org. Um, look for their Skin Deep database and you can evaluate the products that you already have in your home and they will give it a, a letter grade as if it was in school, A through F. Uh, and they will also let you know which ingredients score at those things. And you can look at either products or you can look at a database of ingredients. Um, I highly recommend them in a lot of these uh, classes just because they've done so much work that people can refer to. And I trust their databases because um, they don't necessarily benefit from the databases, right? It's just something that they compiled for human health. So um, I like that. I would go to EWG. We have another question. I've heard frozen vegetables is better than canned. True or false? I believe it is true for a couple reasons. Number one, uh, these days vegetables are flash frozen. So they're frozen at their peak of ripeness. And so they're kind of in stasis until uh, you can eat them for sure. Still not as good as fresh, but you know, in the winter, what are you going to do? Um, canned, I'm not a huge fan of unless they're home canned. So canned from the grocery store in a metal can, um, even the ones that say BPA free have tested with BPA, which is an endocrine disruptor and a carcinogen. So I don't buy canned foods from the supermarket. Um, I invested in what's called an instant pot, a pressure cooker. So I buy dried beans, which are cheaper anyway, and store indefinitely in a glass jar. Um, and then I cook them in the instant pot. It only takes an hour to cook beans from dried to ready to go to use. So I don't buy canned uh, beans that way. And tomatoes, especially, that's like the most commonly bought thing in cans. And unfortunately, the acid content from the tomatoes really leaches out those chemicals that you want no part of. So I highly recommend 
um, buying to either canning your own, which is way tastier, um, or uh, getting them in glass jars or those septic packs, you know, the like the juice box kind of packs, except tall and big. Um, because they don't. Do it. It should cost you um, more than two. I muted everybody. Let me get back up there. Yeah, take the gas. No worries. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, um, any other questions about skin health before we move on to sexual health? Yes. Um, uh, we have a question. Skin, I'm sorry, I apologize. Sunscreen recalls this summer. Any you suggest? Well, I do make one for Haven that I can recommend because it's like six ingredients. My advice to everyone out here is that if you um, read the labels of your body care products, just like you read the labels of your food products, and if there is something you don't understand what it is or you can't pronounce it, just pass it on by. You should be able to not necessarily tastily eat, but anything that you put on your body, you should be willing to put in your body. And um, it, it's very important to get as simple of a product as possible, buy it in small batches, uh, you know, artisanal products that don't have toxic preservatives in them, like lotions, um, come smaller because you wanna use it all before it molds. All of those big bottles of lotion that you buy at the drugstore or the supermarket, they are rife with all kinds of chemicals because it's not natural to have something not break down and decompose and start mildewing and molding when it has liquid content. As soon as you add water to a formula, it's gonna start breaking down, like it attracts bioorganisms and it's a natural process. You have to add a lot of crazy chemicals to get that process to stop. And if you think about it, like, how old is that lotion? How long has it had been sitting around before it even came home with you? And then of course the lotion sits around on your shelf and it doesn't seem to change at all for the year and a half that you have to go through that big pump of lotion. But before that, it was probably two years before it got to you because it had to be manufactured and then put in a warehouse for the manufacturer and then taken to a warehouse for the distributor and then taken to the warehouse for the store and then put on the shelves at the store and then you bought it. Who knows how old it is? All of those chemicals are foreign to life itself. They stop biological processes. So don't put them on your body. Um, you're killing your microbiome. You're harming yourself in ways that we don't even know about yet. Um, again, buying small batch artisanal uh, prod, you know, lotions or things like that that contain water um, are the best way to do it. Um, and, uh, you know, you can check out what Haven has to offer. There's a link at the end of the thing. Um, and there's also other really great local artisans uh, here in Columbus that make lotions and lip balms and deodorants and all kinds of amazing products that don't have all those chemicals in them. And that might have answered this next question of what's best to moisturize dry skin. Just look for a simple list. Yeah, so um, some people need really heavy emollients, like their skin is super dry. I have really thirsty skin. And when I put on even just an oil, like just straight up oil, not even lotion, within a few minutes, it's like it's like I didn't put anything on at all. Um, my massage therapist hates that because she's constantly having to like put more on in order to get that le less, lesser friction. Um, so some people need heavy emollient kind of stuff. And, you know, honestly, really high quality olive oil is great for your skin. Um, so the stuff that you cook with can be good for your skin. Um, if you don't have really thirsty skin and you, you know, you have oilier skin, or maybe it just doesn't seem to soak in as well, a lotion is better for you. What a lotion is, is lipids, those oils and fats that have been emulsified with a liquid. And, um, you know, the liquid immediately goes into the skin surface and then the lipids like slowly soak in. And so you're getting a little bit less of those. It helps to kind of get into the skin layer a little better, but really thirsty skin like mine, if I use lotion, I'm using a lot of lotion. I'm gonna to have to do multiple applications to get it 
where I feel like I've hydrated myself. So it really depends on your skin type for sure. All right, sexual health. So sex is a, a healthy and natural part of most people's lives and it doesn't end when you turn 50. Um, and, you know, there are issues that get in the way, mobility issues as we become less flexible, urinary incontinence or bowel issues that may impact you. Um, don't let them get in your way. Um, if you uh, are interested in having a sexual relationship with someone, um, you know, it's a healthy, wonderful thing that gets you exercise. It gets you, uh, you know, physical exercise, cardiovascular exercise. It also helps regulate your hormones. It makes you feel happier. Um, and so I highly encourage people to have sex safely. That said, you know, 21% of the AIDS cases in the United States were people over the age of 50. Um, it's actually, uh, and, and same with STIs or what we used to call STDs or, uh, venereal diseases, right? Um, so sexually transmitted infections are, uh, higher amongst, uh, people who are 50 and older, not the youngsters. And I think part of that is, um, uh, this population is less likely to use condoms than younger folks. Um, and so learning how to have safe sex, learning how to speak for what you want, um, and finding, you know, a partner who's suitable, uh, if you don't already have one can be obstacles to, uh, sexual health after 50, but there are lots of ways to, um, make that happen for you. And one of the common things that I see in my clinical practice is, um, women uh, of menopausal age saying that they just don't have a libido anymore. And um, that, that tends to concern them rather than not be an issue. And <clears throat> what I tell folks about their libido is the libido happens when all the other things are in balance and in place. You know, you can take supplements that are supposed to enhance your libido, but if you don't have good nutrition and you're not, you know, doing regular movement and getting outside and good sleep and feel safe in your relationship, your libido is not likely to get provoked. Um, so working on having that good balance of things going on for you will naturally increase your libido. There, like I said, there are supplements and I am happy to point people in that direction um, if you need a little lead in your pencil. But honestly, like getting a balanced life is, is the key to feeling sexy again. Any questions about sexual health? Nothing in the chat yet. Okay. One more common thing that I hear, especially from menopausal women, is about uh, vaginal dryness. And I hear from men about erectile dysfunction. Um, we obviously know more about erectile dysfunction because there are drugs for it that obviously work and people make fun jokes about. <clears throat> With vaginal dryness, there, um, number one, it's about balancing hormones, which can be done with herbal therapies. It doesn't have to be uh, HRT. Um, and I know that HRT can be of concern to people who, have, uh, who are surviving cancer, particularly estrogen fed cancers. And so never fear, there are ways to get around vaginal dryness if you cannot take estrogen. Uh, in fact, it would be better for you to do it this way. So if you are interested, you can always email me. If you could put my email in the chat, uh, Darlene, that would be great. I know that some people don't wanna talk about this in a group and I'm happy to answer questions privately. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, now th another thing that happens with aging that we should talk about is the, um, state of decline that happens with our senses and also with our musculoskeletal system. So eyesight goes down, you know, macular degeneration happens. Um, I started wearing glasses in my thirties. I didn't wear them as a kid and, um, all of a sudden I needed them and it's just gotten worse every few years. Yes. I get a prescription 
now I, I have the really great progressive lenses because my eyes are so weird. They, they do all kinds of stuff with farsightedness and nearsightedness and astigmatism. They're getting all bent out of shape. Um, so <clears throat> macular degeneration is very common. There are herbs that you can do to strengthen uh, the, the tissues of the eyes. Um, and there are exercises that you can also do that I can um, talk to people about. But also commonly uh, hearing loss, uh, loss of the sense of smell. Um, a lot of times your proprioceptive or vestibular senses, those are your body awareness of where your body is in space and your sense of balance. Those things can be impaired. And sometimes they're impaired because of the sense which is your nervous system, but also they can be impaired from high blood pressure or low blood pressure, like fluctuating blood pressure. You can feel faint, you can fall. Uh, older people are at a higher risk of falling, um, not just because of proprioception and vestibular senses, but also because of blood pressure and also because the muscles and the tendons and the ligaments are getting weaker um, and they don't necessarily support our strength unless we keep them strong. And that's why I put bone density and weakening muscles in the same line because movement, regular movement is critical to maintain a function, functioning body that gets us around and does what we like to do. So bone density, you know, your bones actually are stimulated to create more bone cells by impact when you are running or jumping or walking, you know, and there's an impact that your, your skeleton is feeling, your <clears throat> osteoblasts uh, are stimulated to create more osteo cells, right? Um, and the same goes with muscles. They need to be moved and exercised in order to stay strong. We all know that if you are bedridden or if you get a cast on your leg because you're not using those muscles, they are super weak when you get out of bed or the cast comes off and everything looks really weird. You need to regularly exercise your body. And that doesn't mean you have to do you know, things that you don't like to exercise your body. There is an appropriate movement for you, I promise you. Whether that's um, <clears throat> going for a nice long walk in nature, gardening, um, you know, maybe you do like walking on a treadmill. Maybe that's awesome for you. Do that. Um, you know, there's lots of different ways that you can get movement. And if you have, um, uh, an impairment of some sort that keeps you from, ha has kept you from finding an appropriate way of exercising, please contact me because, um, one of the things that I do in my wellness coaching, uh, practice, my clinical practice is we find what's right for you. And I have lots of suggestions. So I'm happy to answer questions about, um, you know, oh, I have this issue. What kinds of exercise am I capable of doing? And how can I move from here to where I want to be? Um, Cause really that's wellness, right? You start where you are um, and you start incorporating gradual changes in diet and movement and sleep hygiene and all of these things. And you move yourself forward. Um, you know, when I meet with clients, we have an initial consultation and then I check in with them after a month. And in that month, they have all these things that they need to do. They need to change this. They need to add this. They need to take a supplement. Um, and we check in and we set goalposts because it's a gradual process. It's not going to happen overnight. There's no magic bullets. Uh, and it always requires work. <laughs> so um, yeah, uh, let's find some appropriate movement for you if you uh, are at a loss. And then joints and arthritis, I'm starting to feel that myself. So I've had a bout of tendonitis in my, la in my left elbow for a few months now, and it's just not healing as fast as it used to, because I've gotten this before. Um, and so I have to baby it a lot more and I wear a brace, especially at night. Um, and I'm taking some herbs that help with, you know, uh, tendon kind of uh, restoration, um, but I'm also starting to feel a little bit of osteoarthritis in my hands. Um, you know, they just, they feel weird when I kind of flex my fingers. It feels more stiff, uh, less flexible, a little achy. Um, and that keeps me from some of the things I like to do, like embroidery. I usually, uh, or I used to, 
uh, do embroidery at the end of the night. Like if I'm just going to sit and watch TV or whatever, I'll do embroidery and it feels nice and it's productive and I get to make pretty things. And sometimes I give them away as gifts and sometimes I hang them up in my house. But the arthritis has made it so that I haven't wanted to do that. And that bums me out. But there are things that you can do and things that I am doing um, to, to combat that. Um, and unfortunately, my tendonitis has taken like the lead in terms of what I'm doing for my joints right now. But, um, you know, uh, taking regular turmeric in your body is fantastic for uh, joint flexibility and lowering inflammation in the body. And that goes for the other kind of arthritis too, right? I talked about osteoarthritis, which is common as you age, but also after a lifetime of toxic exposures, so are autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. We have more autoimmune disease in this country than anywhere else on earth. And um, there's a reason for that. We, we actually uh, are exposed to quite a large toxic load in our food, in our water, in our soil, um, in the air, and uh, they're not as regulated as they are in other countries. And so our body, it takes a toll. We have high cancer, we have high autoimmune and they're all interrelated. Um, so that was a tangent, I'm sorry. We're talking about declining senses. Um, yeah, so there are ways to strengthen that. Um, let's go on to the next slide. I know I'm babbling now. Uh, oh yeah, we gotta, so. Uh, I believe this is the last slide. Um, so nutrition and tonic herbalism, these are things that you can do to set a healthy foundation for you to restore systems and, and get you back into balance as well as maintain a healthy balance. Um, malnutrition in seniors is an unfortunate situation. Um, you know, a lot of seniors are on a fixed income and it's really hard to make ends meet. So if you need assistance, there are programs just for um, uh, senior citizens to get healthy food. The Clintonville Resource Center, for example, in Columbus, they have whole programs just for seniors, not just social programs, but food programs, getting rides to the farmer's market, making sure that you um, have, uh, you know, supplemental nutrition assistance program, um, so that you can buy healthy food. There's cooking classes, there's so much there. Um, that is available. Um, I would definitely, even if they're not your neighborhood center, the CRC, um, I would contact them and reach out because their program is so comprehensive, they will be able to refer you to one in your neighborhood. They will know who to contact. Um, and I did include a recipe for soup and a recipe for tea that you can take regularly that are tonic herbalism. When I say tonic herbalism, I mean herbs that you take that are food grade, um, that are safe to ingest and that strengthen or tonify your systems. And so um, the recipes that I sent um, are really fantastic. They have both adaptogens, which I said I would talk about, um, as well as alteratives um, and nutritives. So these are three classes of herbs. Nutritives are things like, I put down stinging nettle and catnip and alfalfa and Am I the only one not hearing Lily um, or did she freeze for everybody? Thank you, Christy. Hopefully she um, comes back and join us. Um, it's the um, oh, Clintonville um, Beachwad Resource Center. Let me see if I can uh, find that um, information and I'll put that in the chat. And Lily did send me attachments. Um, so we will um, be uh, 
uh, I'll be forwarding those on to everybody via email. Darlene, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Irene. Um, I, I, yeah, is she gone? I mean, I don't yeah. hear her anymore. Yeah, she, um, her uh, Wi-Fi dropped, so I'm hoping she's able to log back on here. I am here. Oh, okay. Yay. <laughs> Sorry about okay. that. No, I would um, just want to ask her what, I just want to ask her what she thinks about bone, bone soup. Because mm -hmm. the bones soup, I think it has a lot of uh, collagen and yeah. you know, yeah, bone broth is fantastic. And... I am a big fan of bone broth. It has a lot of collagen if you you know boil it with connective tissue as well, and it has a lot of minerals that some of our food is lacking. So for sure, I love bone broth. And for those of you that don't eat animal products, you can use medicinal and culinary mushrooms to make one that's also nutritive with, uh, I have a picture here of shiitake mushrooms. You can also do maitake and king oyster and a bunch of others. And I'm a big fan of the mushroom section at Saraga Markets here in Columbus. Um, they're an international market and in their produce section, they have a ton of different kinds of fresh mushrooms. So if you like that earthy umami kind of taste, mushroom broth is also great uh, as well as bone broth. Um, so I was talking about nutritives and I'm not sure exactly where the system cut me off, but I was mentioning nettles and catnip, alfalfa and oats on here are nutritives um, and they boost the kind of nutrition that we get uh, in our food um, because, you know, monoculture, the way that we see those fields that are just soybeans or just corn or just wheat depletes the soil. Um, and so we end up adding chemical fertilizers onto things. It's not really how nature would grow um, herself. And so uh, the soil has been depleted, especially of mineral content. And so the more wild food you can eat, like stinging nettles, um, uh, grows wild in a lot of places, the better because you're getting more nutritious food than um, necessarily uh, food that is grown in commercial agriculture. There's a lot of really great small farms out here that are using sustainable methods and, and those are great. And I like to buy my food through them as well. But then I also said that I would talk about adaptogens. Adaptogens are uh, they fortify the endocrine system in some way, usually the adrenals, um, but then they also have a secondary affinity. And so I've mentioned a couple here, ginseng, eleuthero, ashwagandha, tulsi, reishi. Um, so ginseng uh, is pretty well known. It was very popular in the 70s as like um, uh, an herbal tonic or something that gives you energy. And it does. It gives you the kind of energy that is sustainable and doesn't make you drop like caffeine. Eleuthero used to be known as Siberian ginseng and, and it was sort of introduced to the United States after an Olympics that the Russians won quite handily um, because all their athletes were taking Eleuthero. Um, and it's not illegal, it's just a plant. Um, but it definitely helped them enhance their uh, performances big time. Uh, Tulsi is actually um, one that anyone can grow. It's in the basil family. It's also known as holy basil. Um, I have a bunch growing in my garden and it smells amazing. It makes the most wonderful tea and you can also cook with it. Um, and uh, it not only uh, is an adaptogen, but it also helps stabilize blood sugar. So any of you out there that are borderline or definitely diabetic would benefit from taking Tulsi tea regularly. Um, ashwagandha is an herb that I call an herb for our times because we're so anxious now <laughs> with all the things that are happening with climate change and the pandemic and all the stressors that we have. Um, you know, people are anxious and they're not getting a lot of sleep and ashwagandha helps with both anxiety and getting a good night's sleep. It's not a sedative. Um, so it's not like chamomile that you drink it in order to get to sleep. You take it during the day and it, you know, makes you have energy, strengthens you, makes you feel good, 
but it also contributes that night to getting a good night's sleep. And then the top uh, list of, of ingredients here are all mushrooms, reishi, shiitake, maitake, turkey tail. Um, people who survive cancer should know about these particular mushrooms. All of them are high in polysaccharides, which are anti-tumor, anti-cancer. Um, and I don't just say that lightly, there are numerous studies all over the world on these. Um, there's a really fantastic TED talk with a famous mycologist who helped his mom who had stage four breast cancer using turkey tail. Um, and I highly encourage you to check that one out. Uh, reishi is something that I put in a lot of people's formulas because it's not only an adaptogen, but it's also what we call an immunomodulator. Um, it helps regulate the immune system. It doesn't suppress it the way that you do with autoimmune Western biochemical therapies, and it doesn't boost your immune system the way that you would want like to fight the flu or something, but it helps find a golden mean. So people that have overly reactive immune system where they have chronic inflammation or swelling or, um, you know, cancer or uh, any number or like allergies, that's an immune response. Uh, reishi is your best friend, it's great. Uh, in China, they call it the mushroom of immortality um, because if you take it regularly, you know, you're gonna see a long healthy life. Um, well, we, so yeah. We do have a question um, in the chat. Any herb recommendation for focus? Yeah, so focus can be caused by, or lack of focus can be caused by a lot of different things. So when somebody talks to me about that, I tend to take a broad approach and kind of approach it from different ways to get the best possible result. Uh, one of them would be ashwagandha. Another would be something like uh, bacopa, which is an Ayurvedic herb. It helps with, um, you know, attention. Um, and then, uh, I would say something like go to cola or ginkgo could also be of use. It helps with um, memory and corpus callosum activity. The corpus callosum is like the, the split between the two lobes of the brain. And in order to get the right and left side to work together, there's the corpus callosum sort of links them together and communicates between the two sides, two hemispheres. Um, and you need that in order to have some good focus as well. Um, so yeah, so those are some herbs that you can take. And Haven has two formulas. One is called Hocus Focus. Um, and that was designed for people with uh, ADD. Uh, and then we also have one called Brain Juice, which I designed for myself when uh, I was in grad school and had a lot to memorize. And <laughs> so I would put it in my drinking water and just keep it in my system as I was listening to lectures and taking notes and whatnot. Yeah. And it looks like we have, um, is vitamin C supposed to be good for keeping overall health? Yes. Um, so vitamin C is good for a lot of reasons, including immune functioning and, um, you know, uh, cell regeneration. The nice thing about vitamin C is that it's water soluble. So you can't really take too much of it. You're just gonna pee it out if you have too much in your system. So it's not one of those vitamins like vitamin D, if you take too much, you know, could be hepatotoxic. Um, so vitamin C is always something that you can add into your regime if you're just not feeling quite up to snuff. I know we're just a couple minutes over, um, but we do appreciate your time and your expertise slowly. So if, if anybody else um, has any um, last minute comments, as you can see here on the slide, you will be receiving uh, the, the slide deck as well as the handouts that Lily referenced that um, I believe includes those recipes. Um, so here's her contact information. And I did put um, Lily's email directly into the chat. And then you can always reach out to me if you weren't able to um, secure that from the chat. So uh, any last minute questions um, before we wrap up? I'm here. I was going to ask, uh, Darlene, I was going to ask Lily about uh, lion's mane mushroom. Sure. What about it? 
Well, will, will you consider that on, 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 on your variety of mushroom you mentioned? So I love lion's mane. It's really great for cognitive function. It's, it has an affinity for the brain and it's freaking delicious. Um, uh, there are some local cultivators of lion's mane here in central Ohio. Um, if you wanna get it fresh, um, I know that Swainway, which is uh, an urban farm in Columbus grows lion's mane and there's also tiger mushroom farms um, which is a micro enterprise run by uh, a young person. Uh, started when he was seven and I think he's now 15 and he runs his own business. Um, so that's fantastic. Uh, growing mushrooms. But yeah, lion's mane is great, especially if you are looking to improve memory or cognitive functioning um, or like things that are delicious sauteed in butter. Thank you. Can you add, can I, I, I'm, I'm driving, and so I can't write the, the, the farms that you mentioned. Well, Irene, we are, re we are recording this, um, so you can look for this video on our website later today. Okay, great. Thank you. Or tiger mushroom farms. Those are the two I know that grow lion's mane. Okay, um, if anybody else has any additional uh, questions for Lily, uh, you do have her contact information. And again, Lily, we are greatly appreciative of you taking your time uh, to educate us and share this wealth of information. And um, I don't have in front of me what next month's uh, topic is, but we will be back the second Wednesday at noon. I think it's gonna be immune support for the fall maybe. Well, we will definitely get the word out if that's, you know, what, what that topic is. So thank you again, Lily. We greatly appreciate it. And thanks everybody for joining us today. And again, if you had questions that were a little uh, more confidential, please email me. I'm happy to answer. <laughs>